Saturday, MLB Central. We are presented by Cone Resnick, Tom Verducci, Manning, the inside corner. We're in a nice place a week before the postseason starts. You better pack your bags for Philly or L.A. You're covering the postseason on Fox. Fun. It's going to be fun. Best time of year. Good morning to you. And so often this time of year, I feel like we're laser focused on pitching right in October. But there is a certain correlation between hitting home runs and winning a title. And you have looked further into this. What have you found? Yeah, Lauren, especially in today's game where it's so hard to get hits. If you're counting on putting together hits for multi-hit rallies to score runs, good luck in the postseason, the way pitching is these days. So the game has really changed. We love, you and I, we love the small ball, sure. the, the finer points of the game. But the bottom line is you need to hit home runs to win in the postseason. Looking back at the last four World Series champions, all ranked in the top four in home runs in Major League Baseball. Now, if you go back in the previous decade or so, it wasn't that way in the game. You could win a championship multiple ways. The path to a world championship now, to me, must include power. And all these numbers show that. We look at the numbers for this year. The top seven home run hitting teams are all, if not in the postseason, certainly contending going into the last week of the season. The teams in the bottom half, Milwaukee, Kansas City, Detroit, to me, to get through multiple rounds of the postseason, they face an uphill battle. Just go back and look at the numbers just from last year in the postseason and the regular season. When you hit a second home run, you win almost 70% of the time in the regular season. That number goes up to about 75% in the postseason hitting that second home run. Not easy to do, but I know we talk a lot about moving the runners and defense. Those things are still important. But nothing changes the game like those big swings. That's so interesting. I saw the Yankees at the top of the list, and it's interesting because I was talking to Pedro Martinez the other day. We were doing the game on TBS, and Aaron Judge was hitting a home run every day like, like he does, and he says he's seen nothing. He's getting this from me, and of course there are so many other guys on the Yankees who can hit a home run, but they're taking out certain power threats, and they have the luxury of doing that in the postseason. They do. I mean, the Yankees right now look to me like they're as whole as they have they been. They seem it, don't they? The healthy part of it. In fact, Aaron Boone has some decisions to make about the rotation in the postseason. Here's where he seems to be leaning right okay, now. Tell you me. start with Garrett Cole, then you have Rodon in the number two spot. And he actually is thinking about having Clark Schmidt as the hybrid guy behind them in games one and two. You can drop him into a game anywhere. And if he's not using those games one and two, then he's your game three starter. And you say, well, what about Luis Heel? I mean, that guy could be the rookie of the year. He's got wipeout stuff, he can dominate a game. The problem with Heel versus Schmidt is Heel doesn't have the same fastball command. He doesn't have the same control. So it's difficult to drop him into a game and say with runners on base, even middle of the game the way you can with Clark Schmidt. So Heel to me is st pure starter. Schmidt is kind of that hybrid guy. Remember a couple of years ago, Alex Cora talked about his rover. Starting pitchers, you could drop into a game in a postseason somewhere in the middle, even late. Schmidt's that guy. Heel is not because Schmidt is more of the strike zone thrower. Hey, these are great problems to have, right? When you're Aaron Boone. All those guys are capable of not just starting a game, but winning a postseason mm -hmm. game. But right now, it looks like Schmidt is that guy. Could be the bullpen for one and two or and or start game three. In the past, Aaron Boone has been able to use Eliza in so many spots in that bullpen. The way the American League Division Series shapes up, it's game one day off, game two day off. So that changes the rotation as well, right? They're going to get more rest in there. Yeah, that's a great point. That's why I look at teams like Detroit and Cleveland. I know Detroit's got school ball. He's in a category of his own. But otherwise, they're winning games by basically playing tournament baseball, American Legion baseball, I call it, where you use so many different pitchers. And when you have the depth that Cleveland and Detroit has in the bullpen, and as you mentioned, the days off, you can afford to do that a lot more in the postseason than the regular season. In the last week of the regular season, we always talk Rookie of the Year, Cy Young, and you threw out this question, Player of the Year. And we were debating it <laughs> earlier before the show started, and we got nowhere. What do you got? Yeah, let's cause some trouble, let's right? Let's do it. Player of the Year. I think, actually, the Players Association has an award for this. I'm curious how the players would vote on this. Of course, it's two players only. It's Aaron Judge and Shohei Otani. It's amazing how many of the categories of Major League Baseball, they're one and two in some kind of order. So there's no debate about who the two best players are. But now, pick one. Okay, that's a difficult assignment. What's interesting to me is offensively, to me, Judge has the clear advantage. I mean, his OPS is way more. It's like more than 100 points higher than Otani's. But look at that bottom line. That's win probability added. 
what you do offensively to increase your team's chances to win a game. Otani's got the edge. So who do you go with? What I love about Otani, I mean, you talk about the unicorn. He has more 450-foot home runs than every team in baseball but the Colorado Rockies who played out altitude. That's like Babe Ruth kind of stuff, right? Otani has waited his whole career to play meaningful games in September. He's had not just the best September of his career. He's the first player in history in September to have nine home runs and 13 stolen bases. Then you've got Judge, who literally has the highest OPS of any center fielder of all time. He's taking Mickey Mantle out of the equation. He had the highest OPS playing center field. Aaron Judge is playing center field at 6'7", 282. So I, I think it comes down to Otani has done something that we might never see again, unless he does it again. But to me, Judge has had the better offensive season. Even with the stolen base differential, I know Otani's got all that. It's close. But I think judges. Got wow! To I think edge. of time person of the year. It's someone who's done something unprecedented. They both have. Got to pick one. Got to pick fascinating one. Fascinating <laughs> conversation, Tom Reducci. Thank you so much, Robert. Take it away. On Thursday, friends, family, and coworkers gathered in New York City to celebrate the life of MLB Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Billy Bean. Bean died last month at the age of 60 after an 11-month battle with acute myeloid leukemia. As we all know, Billy was a special person. It wasn't just his journey as one of the first in the history of Major League Baseball to publicly come out as gay. He was so much more. He meant so much more. He was one to spread compassion, awareness, understanding, and he did it with a basic decency that everyone felt. It is a special thing to be a Major League player. And make no mistake about it, Billy Bean was a legitimate major league player. Sometimes we lose track of this fact because Billy's contributions to our game after his playing career ended are so numerous and so important. He made everyone feel heard and valued. Through his kindness, his empathy, and his lived experience, Billy made our game a better institution. Billy's impact extended far beyond the playing field. He was a champion for change, using his platform to advocate for acceptance and understanding. His bravery not only helped to break down barriers, but also inspired countless individuals to embrace their true selves with pride. Billy lived a life full of meaning, leaving a legacy that will continue to inspire and guide us. His remarkable story, his valuable work, and the love he shared with us will ensure that he is remembered and honored always. Billy, I love you always. Thank you. The White Sox, Grady Sizemore announcing that the team has moved ace Garrett Crochet's start from Thursday's game against the Angels mm -hmm. to Friday night in Detroit. And his reasoning, this was his quote, and I want to read it to you so you can understand it with the Detroit where they are at. I think it's going to make for good baseball. They're going to be competing for a playoff spot. We want to throw our best guy up against this team that's fighting for a playoff spot. These are our rivals. And AJ Hinch said it's a challenge. And we accept as we welcome you it's back admirable. inside. Your thoughts, Tom, when you read those quotes. Yeah, to me, the first obligation is to Garrett and his health. You know, as long as you're not putting him at any risk, that's your obligation. Your obligation is not to other teams who need help. That's not the job of the White Sox and Grady Sizemore. That a boy, Tom. So as long as he's healthy and you think you can do it, go ahead. But you're, you don't owe these teams anything. Once you lose control of your own destiny, don't go asking for help from other teams. By the way, the, the White Sox just swept the Angels. It's not as good. they're right now still at 120 losses. They're fighting to stave off that one more loss. You don't it's think it's going to matter for it's Detroit. It's not going to matter. Detroit, don't the players turn away. <laughs> they're in. Yeah. They're in. Uh, I'm, I, I love Gra what Grady's doing. Yeah. It's admirable. Yeah, I get it. Completely admirable. Sanctity of the of the uh, of the of the postseason chase. Uh, speaking of the of, of the think, Tigers, I don't think it's going to make it matter. Um, they won again yesterday, defeating the Tampa Bay Rays. Tom, they have won uh, 13 games. Let's see what what it is. Yes, they've won their they've won 13 times when leading after the seventh inning. That is the most in baseball. And you think that there's an interesting comparison to this group of Tigers and to the Chicago Cubs that won a World Series. Yeah, I'm not saying they're going to win the World Series, but what I'm saying is don't overrate experience. I'd rather have youthfulness 
and confidence. And that's how the Tigers are playing right now. They will, I'm taking your word here, D-Row, when they get to the postseason, in their starting lineup, they're likely to have six players in their age 24 season or younger. There's only been one game in baseball history in the postseason with that kind of a lineup, and that was the 2016 Cubs. How did they do, by the way, Roflo? Uh, they won it. Oh, okay, thanks. So <laughs> I know we'd curse. love Thank to talk you. about experience. Give me talent, give me enthusiasm. This team's trajectory changed when they moved to those young players and gave them runway. Yeah. They're in the lineup every day. You know, they started the year with Urshela and Canna and Baez, those guys, fine. But they're a better team that they fully committed to this group of youngsters, and boy, have they come through. 100%. You can't agree. measure what's happening. I, I, I mean this wholeheartedly. When I sit there at night and watch these games, I try and watch them through the eyes of the manager. And you know who's having a heck of a run? A.J. Hitch. Yeah. The man knows what he's doing. Pushing all the he right. called all the players, all the pitchers in and basically said, any man, any time. And that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. He doesn't try to get too cute with his moves as well. And we often find that in the postseason, right? Where, where kind of managers can yep. overthink at times. And I, Sometimes I they get cute human, before right? the game even starts. You know what's crazy, though? To watch them yesterday, that place was jumping. Jumping. America. To listen to Tarek Skubal two days before talk about how awesome it is to play in this environment. To see Matt Vierling's reaction, a guy who came from Philly and has played in the World Series, to see, it's why you do it. And I think it gets lost sometimes. You're trying to make all the money and stay in the big leagues and do all these things, and it's great. But once you put a winner on the field, it's like, it's like. It starts wrong. rolling. You've seen it. And it reminds me of the 95 Mariners refused to lose. Once yep. this thing starts rolling, yeah. it's hard to stop. And let's not lose sight of the fact they had an ace pitcher in Scooble. Yep. But their pitching staff, they're going to take to the postseason the best pitching staff in the American League in the postseason. I mean, only Seattle and Atlanta have a better ERA than Detroit. Yeah. Let's start realizing this team can shut you down. Uh, twins. Are you on the Tigers, Tom? You don't believe that. I actually picked them before this season to go to the postseason with 87 wins with their young players stepping up Jeez. in the second half. Come on. There you go. There you how go. far? It's on the record. Go look it up. In your where, heart, where how they, far where, can they go? I think the American League is wide open. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think the Yank. I think the Yankees are the top on paper right now, but they're certainly beatable. Where, where does it, where does it fall in? Tigers, Orioles, right now. Tigers Orioles. Where who wins? This changes if Cleveland in Baltimore. Gets the best, I've, I've said this. If Cleveland gets the best record, they're one off of the Yankees right yeah, now. Can Baltimore move lose the Astros to the Yankees bracket in the division series? Postseason. The Scooble against Burns game they, one. They have not seen Scooble. The Tigers have seen Burns three times. Yeah. Edge Detroit for that series. Woof. Mm. All right. I gotta, Meanwhile, I have to break it down. Break it in. Uh, the team at the top of the Central, the Guardians, has a guy who is two home runs shy of a 40-40 season. This gentleman, and I have said this story a few times on this show, but it has stuck with me. I interviewed him before a postseason series after that seven-year, 140 million dollar, 141 million dollar extension, and I asked him. I said, "That's light a little, huh?" And I wanted his reaction. And he looked at me and he said, "You don't think that's enough?" I had never heard a reaction like that. It was so authentic, and I thought, my goodness, this guy's easy to root for. What do you think? He's happy there. He's happy. That's what counts, right? That's the best deal, where you're the happiest. Yeah. I, I think he, to me, he's one of my favorite players to watch. Always has been. Him and Jose Altuve, because they play every game like it's their first game in the major leagues. I don't know anybody else in baseball who gets more hustle doubles, turning singles into doubles, than Ramirez. He's the best pole hitter in baseball. I don't know how he hooks every pitch, no matter how far away, into the right field seats. Yeah. He's just a joy to watch. By the way, speaking of doubles, he's two away from two 40 away. doubles. 40 homers, 40, 40 stolen bases, 40 doubles. I think what's crazy to me is I came up in the Braves organization where Chipper Jones was winning MVP, switch hitter, just kind of that franchise type player, and you're sitting there, I'm like, man, Jose Ramirez is doing exactly that and maybe a little bit more at times, stealing bags. It's, it's, it's nuts what he's been able to do. And, and kind of getting, jumping off the Tigers, I think the Guardians Mm -hmm. are going to be a massive problem. Where are they in home runs? You showed that because we've talked about small ball. They were, they were a couple spots behind the Astros. They were like middle of the pack. Middle of the pack. Yeah, they've got enough pop. I they got enough They're a nightmare pop, matchup they... because they put the ball in play and that bullpen, if they've got a lead after six or even five, done. So what is it, by beat? How does that go? 
it, uh, Bybee. Yeah. And they have to decide, is it Williams? Is it, uh, I mean, is Alex Cobb back? Guardian 16. Gavin Williams. In the American League. Boy, home and Class A pitches oh. came on. Do. They got this, they got decisions based on who they play. <laughs> All right, we still got a whole brand new hour of MLB Central. Went away from clinching the NL West for a third year in a row and for the 11th time in the last 12 years. Bottom seven, Dodgers down two nothing. Man on for Will Smith. Fifty season, 400 total bases. Dodgers have a one-game lead on the Phillies for the best. So the other night, moments after Shohei Otani had become the first player ever to go 50-50, 50 plus homers, 50 plus steals in one season. I recorded a video with a stunned and potentially knee-jerk overreaction that the case had just been closed. That Shohei's the baseball goat. My man Deion Sanders backed me up the other day when he said, and I quote, Otani, he's incredible, man. You can compare him to the Jordans and the Tom Brady's of the world. That's who he is. He's doing things we haven't fathomed, said Deion Sanders, who did start in center field and bat leadoff for those teams that I previously mentioned. Dion knows what he's talking about when it comes to baseball. And yes, sir, Otani is doing things we have not fathomed. He's about to win his third MVP in four seasons. And of course, when his arm has been healthy, the man has gone 38 and 19 as a pitcher, including an ERA right at three. In 2022, he finished fourth in the Cy Young race with an ERA of 2.33. Extraordinary. And he's now stolen 55 bases at six feet, four inches tall and 210 pounds. And he, who knows, may up, wind up leading the league in homers for a second straight year. Lord have mercy. No player has ever been this all around versatile. I mean, Babe Ruth couldn't run. Barry Bonds didn't have much of an arm. Otani is actually what you'd call a six-tool player, maybe the first ever six-tool player. He can throw from deep right field to third base, and he can pitch. Like, I mean, top five pitcher pitch. Otani is definitely the tools goat. But here's where I overreacted. Conclusion jumped. I wasn't thinking at that crazy moment, that goosebumps moment, 
that Shohei Otani has never played in the postseason. Not a single swing, not a single pitch. As you probably know, I'm all about the playoffs, the money games, the ones that really matter. Now, do I think Otani will be great when it matters most? I do. But he's now the best player on the Dodger team favored to win it all. Time to back that up. Maybe time for me to calm down just a little, just for a moment. So this is what's dawned on me. Identifying the baseball goat is way, way more complicated than concluding Michael Jordan, obviously, and Tom Brady, obviously. The problem is the most valuable players in baseball are starting pitchers who can pitch only every fifth or sixth or sometimes even seventh day, unless they're Otani or Babe Ruth. So baseball was my first love when I was a kid, but Babe Ruth was even before my time. So I did read some written for kids biography of the Babe that really didn't do his career much justice. And not until last night did I look hard at what he accomplished. Of course, until Hank Aaron came along, Ruth was obviously the greatest home run hitter ever, finished with 714. But I did not realize that Babe Ruth pitched Boston to three World Series titles, pitched them to the titles. In two World Series, he went 3-0 with an 0.87 ERA. He also led the league in ERA one year, along with going 23-12. and Whew. Whoa. Wow. Yet, as you know, Babe Ruth did not have to compete against black or Latin players. And as you probably know, Babe Ruth was a fat guy. So for me, those two factors somehow always disqualified him from being in the GOAT debate. Which brings me to Barry Bonds. I had the honor and privilege of covering Michael Jordan in Chicago and Barry Bonds in San Francisco. Barry Bonds was the greatest hitter ever. Ain't even close. The only hitter who ever had the advantage over the pitcher. While Barry was winning five MVPs in San Francisco to go along with the two that he won previously in Pittsburgh, Barry Bonds shattered Ruth's single-season records for walks and intentional walks and on-base percentage. That's because nobody would pitch to Barry Bonds. He'd only see, and I was at many of these games, maybe a couple of hittable pitches a night, and he would invariably hit those hard, either off or over the wall. And yes, 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 I know all about the performance-enhancing drugs. Barry actually came late to that McGuire Sosa party. But the steroids did not enhance Barry's ability to put bat on ball. Solidly, never, nearly every single swing, bat on ball with the rarest of hand-eye coordination. Steroids didn't help that. And by the way, Barry did win eight gold gloves. And he did steal 52 bases one year in Pittsburgh. That was pre-steroids before he got big. But I must admit, Barry's postseason numbers never quite lived up to his regular seasons. In fact, by his standards, they're pretty sorry. Except for that one great World Series he played in when late in game six, I was there. With a five to nothing lead and a ring nearing his finger, Barry started clowning around during a late at bat. Then Dusty Baker looked like he was celebrating prematurely. And those rally monkey angels fought back and they won six to five. Then they won game seven and Barry Bonds wound up with zero rings. Not goatish.